history has portrayed both typical feudal women bound up by obedience to the male and those that have been going through the painful process of becoming modern females free to decide about their own life. And throughout the Shakespearean canon, we find that we find this kind of struggle or we find complete obedience to the rules that have been established. Discussing gender, family, and society in the early modern period in England, Russ MacDonald states that it was taken as axiomatic that men were superior to women. Not only because Eve was created out of Adam's rib, but also because greater physical strength was associated with, the greater, with greater intellectual capacity and more profound capacity for feeling. So that makes the male superior in thought and in feeling. In supporting this point, he mentions an homily of the state of matrimony, a sermon read from the pulpit during the Anglican church service at the time of Queen Elizabeth's and King James's government. This sermon defines women as weak creatures, not endowed with strength and constancy of mind. Such uzun aklı kısa, uh, sort of approach. She is the weaker vessel. She is of a frail heart. In short, she was the inferior sex and needed the guidance of a male. It followed that because they lacked the intellectual and physical power to cope with what was going on in the essentially male world, the normal occupation for women was marriage and motherhood. Men were the masters and women were their helpmates. In her stereotype role, the woman's space was limited to the home, the only place where she had control over things. Outside the home, stretched a man's world of action she was not allowed to share. Later on, at the very end of the paper, we will see that Lady Muffet <coughs> dares to enter a man's world of action and is crushed by the violence. She assumes that she could put up. At this point, we should keep in mind the contradiction that while in Shakespeare's time, the generally accepted model for the ideal woman was that of the loving and obedient wife, the good mother and house manager, England was on its way towards becoming the leading country in Europe under the rule of Queen Elizabeth, a mighty female with a powerful mind. This was the contradiction. So whatever they think about the makeup of a woman fell flat with the presence of Queen Elizabeth. This double standard concerning the definition of women did not seem to disturb the male-dominated world, however, so long as the wives were kept where they ought to be. Juliet Duesenbeer, points out that in Elizabethan and Jacobian times, freedom of conscience for women was still a new concept. Uh, I don't know whether they were treated as we would uh, think of cats and so on. You know, a cat, some people would say, if he or she is not a cat lover. You say, he's like a cat, she's like a cat. She has no moral judgment. She has no moral sense of morality. So, the women's status 
was more or less uh, that. Women had not been educated to form independent moral judgments, and dramatists asked themselves how the female conscience would work. It is exactly at this point that Shakespeare, the humanist, starts his enquiry concerning the status of woman as a physical and social being that can compute with the male in aspirations, mental capacity, ability for moral choice, and effective action. And he has come up with a good number of portraits that not only represent the time they were created in, but also reveal the ways of the universal female. In this part of the paper, uh, I will be talking about, mostly about the comedies and about how love and marriage and love in marriage is uh, observed by the Elizabethan mind. The rising power of, of monarchy in Elizabethan England promoted marriage and family life as the greatest guarantee for a well-founded society. The long-lasting feudal principle for a marriage arrangement, as still prevalent in many parts of the world, was the consent of the father who, as we find in the words of King Theseus in A Midsummer Night's Dream, who warns Hermia against protesting her father's choice of a husband. He says, to you, Hermia, your father should be as a god, one that composed your beauties, yeah, and one to whom you are, but as a form in wax, by him imprinted, and within his power to leave the figure or disfigure it. Meaning, if you're father chooses to, he can get you killed. He's your god. We observe that Shakespeare raises a protest against this kind of patriarchal attitude. Contrary to the general practice in his society, he has undertaken the task of portraying women that long for a marriage based on the mutual consent of both the male and the female. The most ideal condition for such consent was love. Throughout his career as playwright, Shakespeare has promoted romantic courtship that leads to a happy marriage and children that would carry the images of their parents, as we find in a good number of sonnets from generation to generation. This was perhaps Shakespeare's only solutions to man's most tragic effect, his mortality. The female characterizations in most of the early plays, like the two gentlemen of Verona, are sketchy in that they are either treated as objects to be offered for marriage to whoever gentleman who wants them, or as virgins who secretly pursue the man they love under a male guise. As early as the Taming of the Shrew, however, we also find that Shakespeare protests against marriages arranged by fathers and suitors. The two sisters, Caterina and Bianca, stand in binary opposition to each other in that Bianca is the good-natured, obedient daughter who has soon found her match, while Caterina, the shrewish elder sister, rejects the idea of giving in to the ways of the male-dominated world. It is only when she realizes that Petruccio, first her suitor, then her husband, truly cares for her that she agrees to become a proper wife. 
meaning an obedient wife. However, in this play, the process of domestication that Shakespeare makes Katharina go through in this early comedy is no way acceptable by humanistic or feministic standards and will not be repeated in later plays. Most probably Shakespeare wanted, this is a speculation, to be popular with the male audience in, you know, downgrading uh, Katharina. When a few years later Shakespeare writes Comedy of Errors, whose plot he has borrowed from Plautus, Plautus as the Manekmi twins, he replaces the shrewish wife in the original play with two young females. Adriana, the married woman who demands the love and attention of her husband, and Luciana, the unmarried sister who, while blaming her sister for violating the feudal norms of a proper wife, ends up with a happy marriage based on romantic courtship. The female sketches in Love's Labour's Lost give us Shakespeare's first humanistic glimpses of how female wit outwits that of the male. After all, they have a mind, they can think, and they can work tricks. With four young ladies imposing upon their suitors so as to test their constancy in love, the life of a hermit in absolute seclusion for a whole year. In A Midsummer Night's Dream, the action is based on the violation of the feudal rules of marriage. Hermia goes against the will of her father and that of King Theseus, so as to get united with the man he loves, while Helena is in hot